global environment and natural resources, and also um, uh, economics for the Anthropocene Student Fellow at the Gunn Institute for Ecological Economics. And um, she will be talking about 30 years of forest conversion and the North historical patterns and future projections. Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, my name is Allison. I this is going to be talking today about some of the work I did for my master's degree with Jeff Tanius and some other folks as well. Uh, really looking at patterns, past patterns of forest conversion in the northern forest region, and using those patterns to project future changes. So I like to give a little bit of context. I think a lot of you probably know this, but um, why does why would I want to model? Well, uh, modeling provides uh, a lens through which we can understand and analyze trends and patterns in forest change, um, also over, you know, over space, over time, through different environmental conditions. Um, it also allows us to identify <coughs> critical drivers of trends based on what uh, variables we've included in our models and how well the models are performing. Or if the models don't perform very well, it allows us to see maybe there's some randomness happening in those processes, or, or maybe we need to go back and look and find some different drivers that are driving what we're seeing. Uh, models also allow us to estimate or simulate data in, in places where we might not have information already. So that includes modeling information for the future, looking at places where we don't have spatial, spatial data already, or um, places, uh, environmental conditions that we don't have data for yet. And all of this sort of adds up to the idea that, that models are very helpful for helping us figure out how to manage forests in changing conditions. And um, as we all know, conditions in the forest in this region are changing. So I have some pictures of what's going on up here, but we have um, forest uh, parcelization and fragmentation happening. There are invasive species. Climate change is going to change when we find different tree species. And also forest management itself can change what species and, and we see in forests and where we find forests. So forest pattern and extent are also really important things to look at when we're looking at forests. So as we heard earlier in the day, um, forests can provide riparian buffers to help filter water. Uh, they also are a huge part of carbon storage. They're more than half of the terrestrial carbon storage. Um, where we find forests, and, and the extent of forests is important for connectivity, which is important for biodiversity. So on the top, I have a picture of a land bridge in Canada connecting two forest fragments. So on the bottom is a map of um, cougar movement in the southwest between different fragments of, of um, conserved area. And then finally, this is something I'm personally really interested in. Uh, forests can help us sort of maintain a sense of community identity or um, personal identity, and, and this is the you know, sort of idyllic Vermont landscape. How this looks is really important to people identifying as Vermonters. So that's another really important part of forest pattern and extent. So for this project, we looked at how, um, how patterns of, um, how forest has changed in the past and what the patterns of those changes are, um, looking specifically just at forest cover and non-forest cover. So we're not getting into the details of different trees in this particular model, and then we use those patterns to project future changes in forest cover. So this is the study area that we looked at. This is um, a good chunk of the northern forest region. This is basically determined by three Landsat tiles and cut off at the border of Canada. Um, not that the forest ends there, but a lot of our spatial data does. <laughs> um, and this, oh, there it is. this is the land cover data that I use. So it's a little hard to see here, but we'll zoom in closer on some things as I go through this. Um, but I. This data is from um, something that, that Jen Conius and um, another PhD student, David Gudex Cross, have been working on to map actually forests at the tree species level. So there is data for that. I just sort of walked that up to forest and non-forest cover. Um, and I used the 19, we have um, data for five, every five years from 1985 to 2015. Um, but I just used three time steps because if you get too fine, you, you sort of get a lot of noise in the models. So I calibrated the model on the changes from 1985 to 2000, and then actually validated the model on the, um, compared to the changes from 2000 to 2015. We're going to quickly go into how this works. Uh, so is there a reason this is really dark? This is dark for you. Yeah. It's OK if you guys can see it. I just, is it OK? change to forest during that time period. So this is a um, percent change. So you have 
approximately 20% of non-forest transitioning to forest in that 1985 to 2000 period. And you have 6% of forest changing to non-forest, but just recall, uh, there's a lot more forest in this region, obviously, than non-forest, so that lets you a lot more actual forest area transitioning than non-forest area. The next thing you do is we bring in a bunch of spatial variables, so, um, and we want to calculate where those transitions are correlated with those other spatial variables. So these are all the ones we considered. Uh, we use a Bayesian weights of evidence method to do this correlation. It's really interesting. It lets us look at like different distances to rows and things like that have different um, correlation coefficients for things like different distances. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that, but it's able to capture a lot of differences. And then what we do is we look at which of these variables might be spatially correlated with each other and also which of them are not significant in terms of those transitions, and we just remove those. So anywhere where there isn't an X is where we didn't include that variable. So then once we know how much change is likely to happen and where that change is likely to happen, we're able to simulate a, a new map. And so the first thing I did was I simulated 2000 to 2015, and this is a really important step because that allows us to compare to the actual observed data from 2015. Once we've done that, we're able to simulate future changes. So I did four different climate scenarios, one for constant climate, just, climate, just assuming no climate change, and then three different climate scenarios sort of different paces of change. Um, <laughs> Those turned out to not be very different from the constant climate scenario, which is an interesting result in itself, but I'm just not going to talk about them for the rest of this talk because of, of that. It's not a whole lot to say about that. So these are this is the, the simulated maps that we got. Again, this is it's a broad area, and we're, we're looking at it kind of small pictures here, so you can't see a whole lot going on, but you can see that over time, we see increasing deforestation. That's not particularly surprising. Um, but that's not uniform across the landscape. So here is Burlington, you see a lot of forest loss over this um, 2015 to 2016 time period. Um, similarly, the coast of Maine, this is um, Brunswick on the coast and then Auburn's up in the corner. Um, so you can see, you know, also losing forests in Maine, but that's not the story everywhere across the landscape. In the Adirondacks, we see some forest gains. So there's definitely, this model captures differences not across the board forest loss. In some places, forest is regrowing. So one way you can look at this is you can just calculate the amount of forest area across the landscape and see what sort of net changes are. Uh, generally, what we see is decreasing forest area over time. Um, interestingly, though, this one observed time step, 2000 to 2015, we actually do see a small increase in forest area. It's really important. Actually, I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. The other thing that we looked at is how forest um, pattern has changed over that time period. So we looked at diff four different measures of forest fragmentation, uh, mean forest patch size, forest patch size standard deviation, forest edge density, and total core forest area. So the different climate scenarios are up here, but they're not really very different from each other. Um, or from constant climate. What we do see is that they're, all measures show increasing fragmentation over time in almost every instance here. Um, interestingly, you still see increasing fragmentation in that 2000 to 2015 time step when we saw increasing forest area. So that suggests that even when forest area is regrowing, it's not necessarily <laughs> growing in places that are improving connectivity. The last thing we looked at is what were the explanatory variables that were most driving the changes that we saw in our model. So recall that I said we removed anything that wasn't significant. So these are all significant in terms of the changes, but um, I was able to, to basically rank them by which ones had been the most significant in driving change. And, and these are the top five for each. Um, and this makes a lot of sense, right? This is good if you like it when models do things that you expect. Basically what this shows is that seems like in areas that are prone to development, we're seeing forest loss. That makes sense, right? So we see forest regrowth likely in places with low population densities, places that are far from roads, places that are, have high elevations and steeper slopes. And deforestation, sort of the inverse of that, is likely in places with high population densities, places near other non-forests already, low elevations, flatter areas, and then also places with a, a less protected status. So we were able to classify the, the land based on how protected it was, and places with lower protected status were more likely to be Forested. This is great. This means the model is doing what we would expect. Um, but I want to quickly touch on that 2000 to 2015 forest gain. This is really important because I validated my model on this step. So if we saw that um, that forest was increasing at that time, sort of throw some of the validation into question. The other thing is if 
what we saw most recently is that forest is increasing, maybe we should be modeling the forest based on that change rather than based on that 1985 to 2000 time step. So this was really puzzling for you when I was doing this, and I wasn't sure how to deal with this problem. Um, but since we found that development seemed to be a major um, correlated factor with where we were seeing deforestation, <coughs> we decided to look at some indicators of development to see just sort of how that worked out. And so this is the housing price index um, for the about the same time period. It's kind of hard to see these numbers, but this is about 19, um, 1990 to, to 2016. And what we see is that during this time period, this is the, you know approximately correlated with that 1985 to 2000 time step. You see increasing housing price index, so increasing development pressure. And then you see the same thing now. Um, so you see the sort of similar patterns over time. So this suggests that maybe it actually is better to be modeling based on that 1985 to 2000 time step if we think development is a major factor. But um, what you see in the middle there is a decrease from, what is that about? <coughs> mid 2000s um, to around 2010, so right in that middle, in the middle of that 2000 to 2015, you saw a decrease in development pressure. Um, so that might explain why you saw forest area increase during that time period. The other thing that, um, that I think is a major lesson from this is that the economics really matters. You really have to think about what's going on with economics when you're modeling forest loss in this area. So there are a number of conclusions we can take from this. One is if, the, if those 1985 to 2000 trends are relatively consistent with what's happening now, and if those trends continue, we can expect forest area to decrease over the next few decades. Also, like I said, development appears to be a major factor in which locations experience deforestation or reforestation. Um, and finally, climate doesn't play a significant role, at, at least at this temporal scale, and at the, the level of forest and non-forest. Certainly, climate is going to be important for, for where you find different tree species. You might see changes in forest extent having to do with climate over maybe a 100-year time period, but if you're modeling on a 15-year time step, you're not going to see that being a major driver. And there are a lot of ways that these maps could sort of inform management of forests. One, obviously, they, they show where forest is uh, more likely to disappear in the future. Um, they also sort of provide a, a, a way to look at what the impact of that is in terms of connectivity. Um, they also allow for future estimates of forest-based ecosystem services. So another part of my master's was looking at carbon storage in the forest and landscape, and, and maps like this and looking at how forest is changing over time and how it's likely to change in the future gives us a good sense of what the carbon storage potential of our forest might be. Um, there are all kinds of other applications, but in general, these maps are really helpful for figuring out where to prioritize for conservation. Yeah, 
the fragmentation piece is really the piece that's going to be most relevant when you're looking just at the forest, non-forest level. Um, so that's so the fragmentation measures, and, and there's a lot of you know there's frag sets and a lot of ways to just take like a forest, non-forest map and figure out where fragmentation and connectivity are, where the hotspots of those things are. And so I think that that's really the major um, application is is to conservation 